Hello, I'm Michelle Hearn. I'm a senior curator at the Museum of Florida History. This presentation from Audubon to Bacchus is based on four artists in the Reisner Fine Art Collection. The museum's newest permanent collection, which is composed of almost 200 paintings by 100 different artists. Beginning with John James Audubon, the man many historians believe was America's first great watercolor artist, Audubon was in many ways a mythological figure as well as a historical one. Fortunately, Audubon was a prolific writer who kept extensive notes of his day-to-day -day activities. He was a conscious creator of his identity as an American woodsman and an artist. He wrote his journals with an audience in mind. Sometimes he exaggerated. Once in a while, he made things up. Sometimes other people made things up about him. We know that Audubon was born Jean-Jacques Rubin in the French colony of Saint-Domingue on April 26, 1785. His father was a wealthy French sea captain who owned a sugar plantation on the island. John James Audubon's mother was a French chambermaid named Jean Rubin, who died seven months after giving birth to him. He was then cared for by his father's mistress, Catherine Sinit Bouffard who has been described as a Creole or a quadroon. She was a mixed race. Um, Miss Buffar was also the mother of his younger half-sister, Rose. A revolt by both free and enslaved Africans was heating up on the island, and soon the French colony Audubon had been born into would become the country of Haiti. In 1788, Captain Audubon returned to France and made arrangements to have John and Rose follow him, and not the children were raised by Captain Audubon's legitimate French wife, Anne Monet Audubon. She was a devoted and indulgent stepmother who would later formally adopt the children. From an early age, Audubon loved to draw and preferred exploring the forest around his father's country home instead of schoolwork. He was sent to train at the Naval Academy in France, like his father before him, but he was prone to seasickness and did not perform well in his studies. In 1793, the King of France was executed and the Reign of Terror began. Napoleon Bonaparte establishes himself as First Consul of France in 1799. Desperate to keep his son being conscripted into Napoleon's military, Captain Audubon sent his son to America in 1803. Audubon's fake passport lists his birthplace as the Port of New Orleans instead of the French colony of Saint-Domingue, further obscuring Audubon's illegitimate birth. Much of the family wealth was lost during the Haitian Revolution, but his father was able to sell a parcel of the land and purchase a 284-acre farm in Pennsylvania called Mills Grove. His father also provided a letter of introduction for his son, where he is called John James Audubon for the first time in writing. Initially, young Audubon refused to meet the neighbors as they had immigrated from England, and the English had twice imprisoned his father. But he did meet them, and he fell immediately in love with their eldest daughter, Lucy Bakewell. They married after a five-year courtship. Audubon failed at several business adventures, first the farm, then as a merchant. At one time, he even worked as a taxidermist for the Western Museum in Cincinnati. A series of failures led to Audubon being thrown into debtor's prison in Louisville, where he was forced to declare bankruptcy and sell the family possessions. A low point in his life. Audubon began at this point to seriously consider his notion of publishing a book of all the birds in America. Lucy Audubon, working as a tutor and governess, would at times be the sole support of her and their two sons while Audubon was pursuing his ambitious goal. Audubon was not, however, the first guy to come up with this idea, Alexander Wilson, was already widely known as the American ornithologist. Wilson, who passed away in 1813, worked with Philadelphia publisher George Ord, as Ord had a vested interest in continuing to publish Wilson's works. He and Audubon became rivals. Ord successfully lobbied the publishing and printing communities in Philadelphia and New York to ice out the upstart Audubon. In 1826, Audubon leaves for England and is able to exhibit at the Royal Institute of Edinburgh. While in Edinburgh, artist John Syme paints Audubon's portrait in oils. He is depicted as a self-styled American woodsman with his wolfskin coat, his hunting rifle, and his long flowing locks of hair. 
A deal with his first engraver fell through, but Audubon soon found new engravers with the Havel family. While overseas, away from his beloved Lucy, he worked diligently. First, he made sure the Havel firm faithfully reproduced his birds and that the quality of the engravings was high. He was concerned with the coloration. The Havels employed about 50 women colorists who hand-tinted each Audubon print. Audubon was also out charming the well-to-do into buying subscriptions to the book. The elephant folio were quite large, about two feet by three feet, because Audubon wanted to make life-size images of the birds. Audubon had to pay for the engraving cost, and often he was broke having to hunt down delinquent subscribers. He supplemented his income by painting portraits for wealthy people. The first line was published in 1831 and was well received. With the second volume well underway, Audubon returned to America in September. He requested permission to travel on a government ship to explore points on the East Coast, including the Florida wilderness and the Keys. Here, he created many of the materials for what would be the third of eventually four volumes. Audubon arrived in St. Augustine in November 1831. In plate 269, Audubon depicted a green shank, a European bird never seen before or after in America. Audubon did make some errors. He was not trained as an ornithologist. He did possess, however, great observational skills, and he had great stamina, able to spend long hours out in the field, sometimes under harsh conditions, to make careful field notes of bird habits and behaviors. He did record many new species in Florida. Behind the green shank, his Swedish illustrator, George Lehman, drew in the background of the Castillo de San Marcos. Apparently, the naturalist William Bartram and other writers had given Audubon the idea that Florida was the Garden of Eden, and perhaps due to these high expectations, he was none too impressed with St. Augustine. Of the Castillo, Audubon wrote, an old Spanish council, once the pride of this peninsula, but now decaying fast, end quote. In a letter to Lucy dated December 5, 1831, he states, quote, St. Augustine is the poorest hole in creation, the living very poor and very high. Was it not for the fishes in the bay and a few thousand oranges that grow immediately around the village, the people must undoubtedly abandon it or starve, for they are all too lazy to work, End quote. Florida was ceded by Spain to the United States in 1819. In 1822, the U.S., reorganized the two Spanish colonies into one territory. When Audubon arrived in 1831, Florida was still 14 years away from statehood. The first census, taken in 1830, listed less than 35,000 souls on the peninsula, half of whom were enslaved peoples. In a letter to Lucy, Audubon requested that she send more socks because the salt marshes were running only his. Lucy, for her part, wanted Audubon to leave Florida because she was worried about Indian tax and the wreckers down in the Keys. At this time, there were 16 plantations in East Florida, stretching from St. Augustine down to New Smyrna. On December 14, 1831, Audubon traveled by horse 30 miles south of the city to the plantation of General Joseph Marion Hernandez. A native of St. Augustine, Hernandez was the descendant of Menorcans who had worked as indentured servants on the Turnbull Indigo Plantation. After Spain ceded the Floridas to the United States, Hernandez pledged allegiance to the new country where he had three plantations. He served as a delegate representing the new territory of the United States Congress, becoming the first Hispanic person to serve in the U.S. government. He was later involved in the Seminole Wars, and his plantations were burned down. General Hernandez was a very serious person, and he and Audubon did not really get along. He did not buy a subscription. Audubon painted an American coot, colloquially called Mudhen, uh, during his stay there. He left on Christmas morning and walked 15 miles to the Bulo Plantation, where he was more warmly greeted. John J. Bulo and Audubon had many adventures together, including visiting a nearby boiling spring where he drew a pair of Florida jays. He also drew a pair of yellow red pole warblers in front of a wild orange tree. When Audubon describes orange trees, his romanticized view of Florida returns. Nothing can be more gladdening to the traveler when passing through the uninhabited woods of East Florida than the wild orange groves which he sometimes meets with. As I approached, the rich perfume of the blossoms, the golden hue of the fruits, 
that hung on every twig and lay scattered on the ground, and the deep green of the glossy leaves never failed to produce a most pleasing effect on me. He also noted that, quote, whatever its original country may be supposed to be, the plant is, to all appearances, indigenous in many parts of Florida, not merely in the neighborhood of plantations, but in the wildest portions of that country, end quote. Audubon returned to St. Augustine to wait for the schooner Spark to take him up the St. John's River. After leaving on January 14, 1832, it returned to the city due to a serious storm. The Spark leaves from St. Augustine again on February 5th, but a sailor accidentally shoots himself, which delays the schooner again. Audubon leaves the ship on February 17th and walks back to St. Augustine in a serious rainstorm. He feels defeated and writes, We are surrounded by thousands of alligators, and I dare not suffer my Newfoundland dog Plato to go into the river. Having failed to reach South Florida, where he longed to see, study, and draw the wading birds, or water birds as he called them, Audubon took a schooner to Charleston, South Carolina on March 17, 1832. Finally, on April 19th, he is able to board the U.S. Robin Cutter Marion and sell for the Florida Keys from Charleston. He reaches Indian Key on April 24, 1832. He wrote that as he approached the island, quote, his heart swelled with uncontrollable delight. The air was darkened by whistling wings. The birds, which were almost all new to us, their lovely forms appeared to be arrayed in more brilliant apparel than I had ever before seen." End quote. In 1831, Indian Key was purchased by Jacob Hausman, who was a salvager. Hausman was known both for his shady business practices and his generosity. During the Second Civil War in 1840, the island was attacked by Native Americans. And while most of the 40 to 50 inhabitants escaped, it is estimated that 10 to 15 of them were killed. Today, Indian Key is a state park, as it was in 2010 when Luis Nunez painted this painting, which is also in the Reisner collection. On April 26, 1832, Audubon's 47th birthday, he drew this cormorant, and he drew the background that features other cormorants resting on little mangrove islets. Audubon sailed on to Key West on April 30th, and on May 10th went on to visit the Dry Tortugas, where the largest brick masonry structure in the U.S., Fort Jefferson, had not yet been built. In May, he was thrilled to see flamingos, the birds he was most excited to see in Florida. On May 26, 1832, he painted a watercolor of the flamingo. Audubon began the voyage back to Charleston on May 28, 1832. Scholars argue about the exact number of plates that resulted from his Florida trip, somewhere between 29 and 32, resulting in about 52 birds. What excited Audubon about Florida were the beautiful, elusive wading birds. His complete great work, The Birds of America, is composed of 1,065 birds and 435 plates. Audubon's watercolors were engraved on copper plates and then printed and finally hand-colored. The Harvard art historian Thomas Stibbins has called Audubon America's first great watercolor painter. Audubon was a self-taught artist who did not hesitate to mix media, ink, charcoal, watercolors, wash, in a single work. He developed a grid and pinning system so that he could portray the birds as they appeared in life, and in the backgrounds he included their natural habitats. Audubon shot and killed a lot of birds, some say more than he needed. However, he studied them in the field, and he did not have photography to help him. He did, however, have a growing sense of conservation, and was a major influence on the growth of the American conservation movement. Fellow hunter Theodore Roosevelt, who read and studied Audubon's work, became concerned about the preservation of birds, and was the first to protect vast areas of wilderness. In 1903, President Roosevelt created the first national wildlife refuge on Florida's Pelican Island. As a child, George Ford Grinnell had been tutored by Audubon's wife, Lucy, and was inspired by Audubon's love of birds. For this reason, Grinnell, who was the founder of Forest and Stream, now Field and Stream, named his organization for protecting birds, the Audubon Society. Audubon was one of the earliest voices to sound the alarm for conservation in the United States. In 1826, he wrote, quote, A century hence, nature will have been robbed of many brilliant charms, the rivers will be tormented and turned astray. Scarce a magnolia will Louisiana possess. 
The timid deer will exist nowhere. The fish will no longer abound in rivers. The eagle scarce ever alight. And these millions of lovely monsters be driven away or slain by man.